Well, happy new life, new year, new life family, and welcome to 2024 on this first Sunday. Uh, we're so glad to have you here. Welcome into our worship experience. My name is Andrew Means, and I have the distinct honor of being your online host today. And uh, wh why don't we come on in the room? Let's let's start engaging in the chat. Uh, say good morning to all of your all of your online neighbors. We are one big family, both here in person and inside of inside of our online community. Uh, and while while you're in the chat, let, if you're a first-time visitor, let us know where you're from. If you're from, if you're from the Atlanta area, or across the United States, or across the world, we have a global family here, so we want to make sure we greet we greet you properly. And uh, let us know where you're coming from if you're a first-time visitor, and uh, and we'll be and we'll be so glad to just welcome you. And then. Also, just continue to engage in the chat. Make sure we get get your all of your hallelujahs, all of your amens. Let us know how the worship experience is resonating with you. And then immediately following this worship experience, we'll have an online Zoom room. And if you want to make a decision today, whether it's to give your life to Christ, whether it's to join our church ministry, or if you want to find out a little bit more about our ministry and or even get prayer, uh, all of those things can be addressed inside of the online Zoom room. You don't have to turn on your camera. Just come come as you are and uh, our our online ministers will be willing and able able to serve you and uh, we just look forward to just continuing to greet you and to, and to welcome you here uh, well again it's first Sunday of 2024 so go in this also communion Sunday so the it's the Sunday where we where we come to remember the the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ through our partaking of the Lord's Supper so if you have any crackers any bread any juice or any any water, uh, go ahead and grab those. And during the middle of worship service today, we will be partaking in communion. So make sure you, you guys uh, participate with us in that, and we'll be looking forward to it as well. And uh, just jumping into this new year, we want to just, you know, remind you with the, with some encouragement from the scripture that we are the light of the world. You know, there's uh, lots of things that happened in 2023, whether if it, it was a great year for you, whether if it was a challenging year for you, um, you know, we continue to be the light of the world that Christ has, has directed us to be. And this is represented here in scripture in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14. It says, you are the light of the world. A city is set on the hill that cannot be hidden, nor do they lamp, light a lamp post and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I love that verse because when you're a child of God, no matter what comes your way, no matter what challenges you face, we are still the light of the world that expands light to others. And through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, he is light. And we are connected to his light and through him there is no darkness at all. So I want to encourage you with that today as we enter into a brand new year. And God is going to do some amazing things in us and through us throughout the year. So why don't we go ahead and uh, let us pray and uh, we'll get ready to jump here into worship experience. So Father, we just thank you again for this opportunity to come before you uh, in spirit and in truth, both in person and through our online family. We thank you that you have brought us through another year and we thank you that we have the opportunity to you know, continue to drive for you in 2024. So I pray that you just uh, have your way in this worship experiment, experience. Let souls be saved, may lives be changed, and may you get the glory out of the increase that comes from it all. I pray that you be with our pastor, our worship team, and everybody who has a part in this worship experience. I pray that you just continue to let your light shine through us. We give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Now let's jump into worship experience and we will be right back. God is madly in love with you. He 
loves you in spite of you, in spite of your mess, your mistakes. He loves you in spite of what you've done, what you think, where you've gone. He loves you. I've made so many mistakes in my life. I didn't think anybody would want me that God couldn't get anything out of me. Have you ever been there where you've been so lost and so confused and so hurting that you don't think there's any hope for you at all? And lo and behold, Jesus comes and nudges you on the shoulder and says, I still have it. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the first Sunday of 2024. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Come on and bless the name of the Lord this morning. Our God is good, isn't he? How many of you have been blessed in 2023? How many of you can testify that God kept you in 2023? How many of you can say God has been my helper and my strength in 2023? All right, now, how many are expecting God to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ask or think in 2024? We'll give him an expectation praise this morning. Come on and bless the name of the Lord. Come on and honor the Lord for who he is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do me a favor if you would. Would you just look at your neighbor and tell him, you look great this year. You look great this year. I'm glad I'm sitting beside you and standing beside you. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible says... Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him all his angels. Praise him all his host. Praise him sun and moon and stars of light. The heavens of heavens. The waters that are above the heavens. Let the name of the Lord be praised because he commanded and they were created he hath established them forever and ever and his decree shall not pass praise the lord from the ends of the earth this means everything is praising god the sun the moon the stars the mountains the rivers the streams now if creation honors god and God did not save creation. God did not redeem creation. God did not give grace to creation. God has not expressed mercy to creation. All the mercy and grace and redemption of the Lord is on the people of God. So why should creation praise Him more than us? We do not need a rock to cry out in our place. Our God has done marvelous things. Mighty are your works, O oh Lord, and that my soul knows right well. You are the God and the rock of my salvation. Somebody lift your voice in this place and give God the glory. Hallelujah, Lord. We bless you, O oh God. We honor you, God. You're faithful in every way. O oh God, you honor your word. You look after your word to bless us. So let your glory fill this house. Be magnified. Hallelujah. 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 Be magnified in this place. Oh, my soul magnifies the Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen again. Ah, I feel like going to church. Anybody feel like blessing his name? 
Come on, let's bless the name of the Lord. Come on and lift your voice, new life. Give him the best praise that you have. Hallelujah. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. <laughs> you were created to worship him. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm excited. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> you were created to worship this morning, and we're going to give him our best praise. Hey, give him praise. Come on, clap your hands. to give him praise and that's what we have to do every night and every day we are not here alone he will show up every time when we begin to worship his presence comes and sits inside and clap your hands all ye people come on and clap your hands all ye people clap your hands all ye people
and won't stop praising. You know, there's so many people who would love to be here, but can't. They have challenges in their body, health issues, many are in hospitals, and some were here this time last year and didn't make it today. But for some reason, and you and I both know it had nothing to do with us, you are here this morning. You're alive and you're well. I mean, you don't have everything you want, but you have everything you need. God has been better to you than you have deserved. And this whole service, you've been sitting there waiting for the song to be over, not knowing that God is calling you to praise and worship him. This is the first day. And what you do on the first Sunday is an indication of what's going to happen the rest of the year. And I don't know about you, but God's been too good to me for me to sit down on my praise. So I won't stop. And I can't stop praising his name. Somebody say, everybody praise. Come on, let's worship him. And I won't stop praising. Can't stop. Can't stop. Won't stop. God the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. While you're still standing, would you grab your elements in this spirit of praise and worship that we have now? Grab your elements. And those of you that are at home, we're getting ready to partake of the Lord's Supper. We're getting ready to have what we call communion. And it's called communion because it is our union with each other and our union with God. So if you're watching at home, would you just take a quick moment, run into your kitchen or cupboard, and would you grab some elements, bread and wine or water or juice, and if you would bring it back to, um, to the screen, and let's be together as a worship community of faith and worship the Lord together. I want you to know that we are praising God and celebrating God for all that he's done in the last year and all that we're expecting him to do in this year. And it is only right that we give God praise. But I don't want us to forget. I don't want us to forget that the reason why we praise and worship God is not about things. That's secondary. You worship God because of salvation. Because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Because he saved and redeemed us. And nobody knows your testimony like you know your testimony. You know what God saved you from. I'm looking at some redeemed people, but you look great this morning. But if we had seen you 10 years ago, if we had seen you 20 years ago, if we had seen you last week, you don't look like then like you look now. Somebody say, but God. Oh, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Hallelujah. We were wretches undone, but God. We were sinking deep in sin, but God. We were faltering in our confidence, but God. We were strung out on drugs, but God. We were getting high on stuff you ain't had no business getting high on. But God, we were lost in our sins. 
but God, we were running from the throne of grace, but God, we were shackled by our guilt, enslaved by our fear, encumbered by our pain. Somebody said, but God, made a way out of no way, but God, provided his cross, but God, saved us by his blood, but God, gave us a new life, but God, redeemed our life from destruction, but God, called us by a new name. Anybody got a but God testimony? Anybody got a but God praise? Had it not been for the blood of Jesus, had it not been for the cross of Christ, had it not been for the blood that washed away my sins, I would not be alive today. Neither would you. But oh, I thank God that the blood never loses its power. I thank God that the blood still redeems. I thank God that the blood still saves. Anybody got a witness in here? Whenever danger comes, I plead the blood. When the accuser comes, I plead the blood. When the enemy rushes in, I plead the blood. The blood is sufficient. The blood is enough. The blood sings. The blood delivers. Grandmama used to say it like this. The blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. I get excited about the cross. I know where he brought me from. Anybody know where he brought you from? Father, we honor your name and glorify you. We thank you, O oh God, for the blood still has power. The blood still changes lives. We are all witnesses and testaments we are your written epistles that lives can change, that hearts can be redeemed. We are a testimony that you are a redeeming God. So Lord, I pray now that you would consecrate these elements we hold in our hands. Use them for your glory. Transform them from their mere carnal usage to a spiritual usage. May the blood, may the wine remind us of your blood. May the bread remind us of your body. Broken, bruised, beaded, beaten and battered for us that we might be born again. May we never lose our affection for the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you please take the elements in your hand? One side conceals the bread. Peel it back. Place it in your hands. Lift it before the Lord. Father, this bread is a symbol of the broken body of your son. Thank you for giving him. Thank you for allowing him to leave the wonders and glories of heaven, to come to the miseries and mess of earth. That he who knew no sin became sin for us that we who are sinful might become the righteousness 
of God in Christ. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement required for our peace was laid upon him and by his stripes our souls are healed let us take together in Jesus name amen turn the element over and reveal the cup would you lift it before the Lord without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin you are not saved because you had a guilty conscience you're not saved because you're a good person you're not saved because you try to do right the only reason why you have a claim to glory is because Jesus shed his innocent blood a lamb died in your place never forget that his blood was spilled for no wrong that he had done but for all the wrong that we had done so we receive now in honor of that sacrifice let us drink together Lord we now declare our union with you we are one with you the atonement has been fulfilled and our salvation has been secured thank you for your grace hallelujah thank you for your grace thank you for your grace in Jesus name would you lift those hands in the presence of the Lord the blood that never loses its power the blood that never loses its power it reaches to the highest mountain it flows to the lowest valley anybody know it will never lose its power let's worship the Lord together the blood that Jesus shed for me He did it well
together and bless the name of the Lord in this house. I'm sorry, that just, that reminded me of South Carolina. Old country church with boards on the floor, no sheetrock on the wall, the windows are broken, two of the lights don't work, but oh, we knew how to have church. We didn't have no air conditioning, right. but we had Jesus, yes. and we got to singing about the blood. How it never loses its power. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Never. Hallelujah. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, God. Bless you, God. If you're watching online, we just want to say welcome to you. We are so grateful that you are with us this morning. We want you to know that we wish you were here physically, but we know that distance does not, distance does not hinder the presence of God. We welcome you. Would you help me give a warm welcome to our online family, our virtual online community? Come on and help me say welcome to all of them. 
If you're worshiping with us for the first time today, if this is your first time at a New Life Worship Experience, we're so glad that you're here. Would you just wave your hand at us wherever you are? If this is your first time, this is your day one. Amen. Amen. Come on, New Life. Let's give our first timers a really, really big welcome. Come on, let's give them a real big, big welcome. We praise God for you. Well, I've got a couple things I want to say. First of all, before I get into one of our very important announcements, I just want to remind all of you that we are fasting as a church. We are fasting as a church family. The entire month of January, we set it aside to participate in a corporate fast. Now, I've taught on fasting in the past, and I encourage you, if you're not familiar with much of it or don't understand much of what it is, that you just go back and look at some of our previous messages on fasting. You can simply find them on YouTube and put in the word fast, and um, it will come up. We've taught about the body and health. We've taught about fasting and spiritual prayer and power and why we fast and what fasting does, the power that it brings. Jesus said that there are some kinds of challenges, demons, some kinds of burdens and issues that we face that do not leave except by prayer and fasting. We fast not only for the, our current circumstances, but we fast as a protection in our future circumstances. And so there's a fasting guide that we gave out a few Sundays ago, and uh, in that guide is also available online. If you go to our website, we'll tell you how to do that in a moment. But it has a list of different kinds of fast, the partial fast, the Daniel fast, the full fast. And some people, the Lord may be calling you not to fast food, but to fast something else that serves as a distraction in your prayer time, your time with God, and your relationship with God. It might be social media. It might be Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and all of that. It may be certain relationships. It might be movies or certain shows on television that don't edify your spirit. It may be something else in your life that God's calling you to fast. I'm praying that when the Lord speaks that to your heart, that you won't debate with God and you won't argue with God. Because everything that God desires for your life is wrapped in a sacrifice. I want to tell you that whatever that dream or vision that God's given you is not going to happen without a sacrifice. And you're going to be called to make physical sacrifices, financial sacrifices, corporate and business sacrifices, family and marriage sacrifices. So the spirit of sacrifice is what we must have in order to succeed at anything. And we're good at making those practical sacrifices but we fail so often in making those spiritual sacrifices. So I'm praying today that you would make the, dis make the commitment to set the course of your physical sacrifices for this year by establishing a firm foundation on spiritual sacrifices. And so that's our call to fast. The entire church is doing it. Online is doing it all across the country. And those who watch us in different parts of the world, they're all doing and participating in this fast together as a family for the entire month of January. And I know that you're doing it as well. Let's give God praise for our fast. <clears throat> now, I want to mention that there are devotions that we're doing every morning from Monday through Friday online. So if you go to our website, you'll find our online portals and all of our morning devotions are there on YouTube and on um, Facebook and on Church Online. We're live at 7 a.m. every single morning, praying and do, uh, reading the scriptures, studying the word, hearing a word from God. And I don't know about you, but those mornings are powerful. I mean, the Lord just shows up and God, he is there. So I, I don't want you to miss it. Don't miss it. Monday through Friday, every morning at seven o'clock in the morning. If you have to get to work, 
Don't watch it while you're driving. <laughs> Just listen to it while you're driving, but don't watch it. If you have time, get in front of that computer screen or on that uh, phone or iPad or tablet or so, get in front of it. Um, one of our elders told me, Elder, Elder Levitt, that he's at his office uh, that time some mornings and he's watching it right from his office and uh, praying together. We pray for needs and we pray for scenarios. We use our chat space to create a community and we pray for each other. So every morning at seven, the way in which you watch worship service is, is how you'll watch this on all of our streaming channels. And so we thank and praise God for it. There are devotion, devotional books that have been curated and written. I've compiled them from several ministers in our church. I have written them. My wife and I have written uh, devotional, and then there are other devotionals from other uh, popular books. We placed in that for 31 days, 31 devotionals. Now, we only had a limited supply of copies today. And so if they're all gone from the tables outside of the sanctuary, don't fret. We'll have more on next week so you can have your own copy. We are asking everybody to get one copy. Amen. One copy. And no, you can't send it to your friend that live in Tuscaloosa. You can't do that. All right, um, but if you're online, we're going to make this devotional available in uh, soft copy form so that you can have a copy of it online. So we'll let you know more about that as soon as it is available. And all God's people said, amen. All right, now I want to mention something that is heavy on my heart. And um, uh, years ago when I was uh, 18 and 19 years old, I was serving in a church in uh, downtown Atlanta. It was one of our historic churches there, and I was serving as a minister there and as an associate there. And um, I remember coming to the church many Sundays, many Sundays, and there were homeless people that were sleeping on the steps of the church, many Sundays. And this particular church would not open its doors for those individuals who were sleeping outside to come in. This particular church would not do that. Um, and it literally broke my heart. The pastor did everything he could to convince them to have some kind of shelter experience because people that live downtown were homeless. And these people were going to other churches. And may I be honest with you? May I be honest with you? Other churches that did not look like the people that were sleeping on the steps and their doors were open and they were giving soup kitchens and meals and the churches of the people that looked like those who were sleeping on the steps were closed. And I vowed that would never happen at our church. That would never happen at our church. Last night, it did. Last night, it did. It will never happen again. I was here last night and we had to turn away seven people, four the first time and then three came afterwards, seven people because we did not have sufficient and proper volunteer staff in our warming station and we couldn't open. We will never do that again. If my wife and I have to come here and volunteer every single day, that's what we'll do. Now, I know that you're busy, and I know you've got a lot going on, but I want you to remember the church that you joined. You joined a church that loves homeless, hurting, helpless people. You joined a church that loves those people. I need you to volunteer. I'm not fussing at you. I'm not, I am, but not much. Not much. Still love you. I need you to volunteer. I need you to volunteer. We're going to be open starting tomorrow night, every single day. Every single day until the end of the winter. Every single day. So we've set and scheduled our volunteer times so that we can volunteer and open. There are three shifts that we'd like you to serve in. No one is going to serve overnight. We have security that's going to be here overnight. No one serves then. The first shift is from six to eight, and that's the shift that we give dinner. So we serve a full meal 
and dinner, and then the second shift shift starts from 6 to 10. So 6 to 8 is a shorter shift. 6 to 10 is the longer shift. That's about four hours. If you can't do 6, you can do 7, or you can do 8, or you can do 9. At that shift, we get our guests and our residents ready and set in their cots so that they are able to sleep for the night. And then we turn it over to security. Security is here. The building is secured and locked. We have space for 13, 13 individuals to come. And if more come, then we'll get more cots out as time goes on. We want to be open every single night. A church this size, that should be no problem at all. No problem at all for a church size. So we're asking people to rotate and to come. If you're saying, hey, I only can do one evening a week. That's all I can do. Tuesday is my day. I can do six to eight, but I can't do anything more. Then I want you to sign up for six to eight on Tuesdays. If you say, hey, you know what? I can do two Wednesdays a week. That's all I can do. Two Wednesdays a month. I can only do one Wednesday, skip a Wednesday, and another one. That's all I can do. Sign up for that. If you're saying, you know what, I'm retired, I've got a lot of time on my hands, I know that I can do two a night. I can do Mondays and Fridays, or I can do, you make that decision on what you can do. If you say, you know what, I can do this three times this winter, that's all I can do is three times this winter, I'll choose what those three times are, and I'm going to do it. Here's what I'm asking you to do. Honor the commitment that you made when you walked down this aisle or filled out a form and joined this church. You joined a church that loves hurting people. May it never be said that our doors were closed whenever people needed to be sheltered. Now I've had a chance to drive in this area up and down, back and forth. I know this area back and forth and I want to tell you that if we're closed, no one else is open. Are you understanding what I'm saying to you? I had a lot of people that say, you know what, you know, homeless folks, man, they're, they're there for their own reasons and they're there. We're not going to get into that argument. We don't judge, we give grace. Because if God had judged us, we wouldn't be here. Amen. Coming in this morning, I looked under the bridge at Wesley Chapel and there were tents of people living under that bridge at Wesley Chapel. They're starting a small tent, little tent area right out here on Flat Shows Road and it's too close to new life. It's too close to new life. It's too close to new life. We can do better we can do better. Amen. So I want to thank you in advance for registering and signing up. There should be information on the screen for you. If you got a phone or something, would you take it? Please scan that QR code. It'll take you directly to a special volunteer website for you to volunteer. Make that commitment to do so. Short shifts. No one stays overnight. We come back. We need someone to come back with us. Five in the morning and we offer breakfast before we say goodbye to our guests. Now, if we have to hire people to do it, we'll do that. But you do understand that should never have to happen. Amen? We can do better. All right. Let's give God praise. Let's give God praise. All right. Look at your neighbor and say, okay, I'll spank it over. I'll spank it over. Look at your other neighbor and say, he happy now. He happy now. <laughs> I love you guys. Thank you so much for letting me be a pastor. All right. The Lord has called us to do so much here at our church, and um, we are honored to do it. And we do it because of the generosity of the people of God. So it's giving time. Let's honor the Lord for the opportunity that we have to give. Amen. Amen. I want you to please take note, if you would, of the ways in which you can give here at our church. And many of you have never established a push pay account yet, and I want to encourage you to consider doing that. It's quick, it's easy, and it's giving online. It allows you to give uh, your offerings. You can give one time or you can schedule in your giving on a regular basis. And the first time you use the push pay app or the push pay process, it's about 30 seconds the very first time you use it. And then every uh, time you use it after that, it's literally 10 seconds. 
we have done so much due diligence to ensure that your records and your data and your giving is absolutely safe. So when you give here at our church, you know that it's safe, you know it's secure, and you know where it goes. It goes into providing food and cots and the meals that we give every night. We just committed a few moments ago to give a dinner to people that need it every single night for the rest of the winter. So that's a major commitment that's going to cost funds to do that. Um, we have food that we serve every single week here at our church, hot meals we give. We give away food boxes by the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds every single week. We do them at least 50 to 60 a day, sometimes here at our, at our church and at our community center. And all of those things take uh, funds to utilize. We have an after school program that ministers to third and fourth graders who have special reading disabilities um, and math disabilities. And we come together provide meals for them. We go and pick them up and uh, take them, uh, uh, bring them, bust them in from their schools. And all of that requires resources to do. So when you give and when you tithe, you know exactly where your tithe is going. On a Saturday, if you have any questions about where does a tithe go, just come out here on a Saturday. You ain't got to volunteer. Just come and watch. Come and look and you'll be amazed at all the Lord does through our church. And all God's people said, Amen. Father, I thank you for this wonderful opportunity that we have to give. Thank you, God, that you have blessed us to be able to support ministry. So now I pray that you would receive from our hands into your kingdom. Pray that you bless these who are giving, every home and every household. Our motivation in giving is not to receive. Our motivation in giving is because you have given to us so much. Lord, thank you for our income, our jobs, our careers, our streams of income, the ways in which we make a living. I ask now, God, that you would receive from our hand into the kingdom. Be a blessing, I pray in Jesus' name to the people who live here and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen and amen again. There's, amen. There's three ways you can give. They're on the screen. You can give online by going to our website, give through text. And if you're at home, you can mail in your gifts to the address on the bottom of your screen. Let's all take a moment as a family together. Let's take out our smartphones or our devices. And as one church community, let's all give together. God's people said amen it is just that easy thank you so much if you want to learn more about the warming station and if there are some unique things that you'd like to help with or unique uh, times you need to, to serve we have volunteers that will be in the lobby today right after service um, you want to see Mr. Brother Michael Bryant Pastor Michael Bryant I like to call him pastor because everybody said this is Pastor Michael Pastor Michael Please see Michael Bryant. He'll be in the lobby right after worship services today and be able to answer questions and help facilitate you getting signed up if that is what you so desire. Amen. We're going to be talking about refuge today. We started talking about it a little bit at a New Year's Eve service, and we're going to be developing a safe haven for our dreams, our visions, the things God's called us to in this year and finding where the safety is, finding where the safe place is. And I pray that your heart is open to hear the word of God. Let's worship God together now. Can we do that? Let's worship God and our hearts are open to receive the word of God. All over the building and even online, can we take a moment and thank God for rescuing us? Say this out of your mouth. Just say, you have rescued my life. And I'm never going back. So for that, my response is hallelujah. My response is hallelujah. My response is hallelujah. My response 
will forever be. Hallelujah. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. And I'm
deserve it. Yeah. Hey. Yes. You deserve it. Hey. Yes. You deserve it. Yes. Thank you, God. You deserve it. You deserve Yes, God. You deserve of the Lord and so Lord when we say that you deserve it it is us giving you your due all the glory is yours you have done amazingly undeserving things in our life you have been faithful you've honored your word and Lord, you've kept every promise. We look back over our life and we are absolutely amazed at the things you've brought us through. The rivers we've had to cross. The mountains we've had to climb. The tears we've had to shed. But through it all, you've been faithful. Yes, God. Not one good word of your promise has ever fallen to the ground unfulfilled. You keep doing over and over and over again everything you promise. So Lord, when we say you deserve it, we mean you deserve it. You deserve the honor of our life. You deserve the glory from our life. You deserve the praise from our lips. You deserve our commitment. You deserve our sacrifice. You deserve our hearts. So keep doing what you do, as I know you already will. In Jesus' name, amen and amen again. Somebody help me bless the Lord. Oh, help me bless the name of the Lord. Take your seats and grab your Bibles this morning and we have just a simple word. It's not anything complex or just a simple word today I want to honor the fact that this is a new year and the theme that we've carried from last year and I was praying for the Lord to if the Lord had a new theme for us and that's what I wanted to know and, and God kept saying no and that dream is still our theme but not the dream of the church that you've heard us talk about so much but your own visions and your own dreams and your own heart what's God saying to you this year last year was a breakthrough year for so many people 
you started things you never imagined you could do. I've gotten tons of people that have sent me articles they've written, books that they've written, business that they've started, homes that they've bought that they're asking to come and bless it. We've seen so much seeds deposited in the lives of people in 23. But here's the thing that I know about life, and that is every seed that is sown, there is a weed that is waiting to choke out that seed. And what you need is to be able to place your dream, your vision, your giftings in a safe place, protected from all of the harm and danger that's around it. And to have a place of refuge, not just for you, but for your family, for your heart, for your finances, for your future, for all that God has called you to be. And so we've been talking about refuge in this season. Refuge meaning this is where God is calling us to. A safety in the hands and the arms of the Lord Jesus. And so I have an interesting passage. It's in the book of Revelation. Chapter 12. And... Um, it is a very simple message from what some consider to be a complicated book, but it is certainly not a complicated book. It's a book that has a blessing to us if we read it. It speaks in this particular chapter, in chapter 12, it sort of balances between what might be considered as two halves of the book. From chapter 11 down, we have the portion of the book that speaks about the tribulation. And this is the end of time. This is the sealing of the servants and saints of God. The return of the Lamb. The rapture, of course, of the church takes, first, takes place first. And then the, the whole world goes into a time and a season of tribulation. And then right at chapter 13, which is on the other side of this chapter 12, there is a period of time that's known as the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation is those final three and a half years of this seven-year trouble. The Old Testament it is called um, the Day of the Lord, the Day of Jacob's Trouble. And we see this, this double halves here in the book of Revelation. There are certainly instances of that Great Tribulation period that's expressed in all of the judgments the seven seals and the seven bowls and the seven trumpets. But from 13, 14 to 15 to 16, we see the activity of the Antichrist and the activity of Satan being increased. And many people read the book of Revelation and they read it purely for its end time purposes. They only think that this is telling us what's going to happen. And so they read it, you know, kind of like, an insurance policy. You know, you, you look at it a couple of times to make sure it's still there. And then you kind of put it on the shelf and you pick it up later on whenever you think you might need it. The book of Revelation is not just about the end time. It has principles for every time, for all time. And today, right now, this, this book is demonstrating what is happening now that is a foreshadowing of what will happen in the end. It foreshadows. Foreshadows simply means that you get, the, you get the down payment. You get the first installment of the trouble, the first installment of the tribulation, the first installment of the great day of the Lord. You get the first installment of God's wrath being poured out, and it's done in a foreshadowing uh, perspective, a preview, if you would, that we taste it now what the world will drink in full later. But make no mistake, we do taste it now. It's a taste of death. It's a taste of trial, a taste of struggle, a taste of pain. And the same enemy that is, um, that is spoken of in the book of Revelation, especially in the latter chapters after chapter 12, that enemy is alive and operating today. 
And the same things that he does then, he's doing right now. The truth about the enemy is that he has no new tactics. He has been doing the same thing all of human history. And if you trace back human history all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden, he is the same trickster, the same liar, and the same murderer, and the same thief that he's always been. He just simply has an opportunity to do it on the earth unbridled in the end times because the church which carries the presence and power of the Holy Spirit within us will be raptured from the earth. And as we are raptured from the earth, nothing shall be on the earth to restrain the hand of Satan's wickedness. But make no mistake about it, he is just as wicked today as he will be then. He's, no, he's not going to get wickeder. He is as wicked as he will always be. The difference is the Holy Ghost is restraining the evil that he intends. The Holy Ghost restrains his evil. It holds back the evil that he would do. You do understand, don't you, that you would not be here if the Spirit of God had not been restraining the evil that Satan had planned in your life. You do know that you would not be dressed nice on the first Sunday of the year sitting in church if the devil had his way. Thank God we have an edge of protection around us. Thank God we have a city of refuge to go to. Thank God we are protected by the hand and grace of a powerful God. Hallelujah. And right nestled in between the first 11 chapters in this book that leads up to this great time of Jacob's trouble, this great time of the day of the Lord. And then from the 13th chapter to the 22nd in this book, it speaks of that last three and a half years of that tribulation and how the victory of God is won through Jesus, the battle of Armageddon and God, he now gets glory as Jesus is exalted. And then the great judgment takes place. And then we saw the new heaven and the new earth, but right in the middle of the mess, is chapter 12 and chapter 12 balances all of human history in this metaphorical analogy that he gives of a dragon a woman and a child and I want us to read it for just a moment in Revelation 12 verse 1 says there appeared a great wonder in heaven a woman clothed with the Sun the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. There appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns, and the heads of the dragon, seven meaning complete, full, heads meaning authority and power, horns, are the power on that authority. It's seven because it's full and complete because the church has been raptured and there is no restraint to evil. This is why the church exists. We exist to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. These are the angels and did cast them down to earth and the dragon stood before woman who was ready to give birth to her baby he stood before the woman to devour the child as soon as it was born and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne and the woman fled into the wilderness, listen, where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and sixty days, the latter half of the tribulation. That's three and a half years. That's being sheltered from the worst of Satan's attacks. And God prepared a place 
for her. I want to talk about refuge. Let the church say refuge. Now, I want to just give very quickly and briefly what it is that we just read. We just read a analogy, and the scriptures are full of analogies in what we call prophetic writing. In apocalyptic writing, traditionally this is prophetic writing, but apocalyptic style would be books like the book of Daniel, um, the book of Zechariah, some would say, portions of the book of Ezekiel, and of course, <clears throat> the book of Revelation. It speaks of this apocalypse. It talks about the unveiling of God's wrath or the unveiling of God's amazing mercy. This is the unveiling of God uh, in Jesus Christ. And so this apocalyptic writing, it unveils it unveils this time of wrath of the Lord. And so often analogies and metaphors and similes are used in symbolic measure to communicate and demonstrate pictures of the reality of good versus evil. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And so these are pictures that the scripture begins to paint. And John, as he's writing, as Jesus is dictating to him this revelation, he is writing and he's speaking of this picturesque language. And here he sees in verse number one, he says, it's a great wonder in heaven. One of the ways you know that this is a sign, a symbol, these are figures. You know that whenever the book of Revelation says a wonder in heaven, I saw something in heaven. This means it's not an earthly thing. It's a heavenly thing that is to meant to look like an earthly thing. Are you guys understanding this? God had to often paint pictures of his truth because people were dull in their hearing and could not hear the truth of the word of God, could not understand that truth. So God would paint these pictures to help them understand truths they could not normally comprehend. This is why Jesus, the master teacher, taught in parables. He taught in parables because of the dullness of the hearing of the people that he was speaking to. He said on one occasion to his disciples in Matthew 13, I talk to them in parables and dark sayings, but to you I speak plainly because you should be mature enough to understand the truths and mysteries of the kingdom of God. Here you have another parable, and this parable is a wonder that John sees in heaven, he sees a woman who is clothed with the sun and the moon upon her head and a crown of 12 stars. Now, generally in prophetic writing, a woman represents something that would be vile or so. And this is what many in a patriarchy society try to harp on. But very clearly, that's not the case here. This is a woman who represents something glorious. This woman symbolizes two portions, two portions of human history, of God's history, two portions. The first portion is the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel in its literal and in its historical context, the woman symbolizes Israel. And Israel is the nation that was pregnant for thousands of years, literally 2,000 years, history would tell us, pregnant with Jesus. After the birth, after the, after the giving of the promise to Abram that you shall have a son and that son shall reign and live as the lion of a tribe, the scepter of a king, that this promise to Abram to have Isaac and Isaac had Jacob and so on and it flows to David and then it flows to Christ, pregnant for 42 generations pregnant with a child. The child is the Messiah of the world. This child was meant to save both Jew and Gentile. God has no favorites because he chose Israel, does not make Israel his favorite. Is anybody hearing this? You're chosen by God for something that God chose you to do that he didn't choose somebody else to do, but don't think that you are favored over anybody else. God loves every single person Equally, he loves every single person unconditionally, and he loves every single person incomprehensibly. 
So he loves Israel and he loves the Gentiles. But he chose Israel to bring about the Messiah to save both Israel and the Gentiles. So this Messiah, Jesus, the one we call the Christ who is to come, is pregnant in the woman's womb for 42 generations. And she gives birth to this child. And this birth of the child comes through the virgin womb of Mary. Born in a manger. Living in a stable. Having animals as his company. Is anybody hearing this? That he might die on a cross. And his death effectuated the second aspect of this particular prophecy. The first aspect is the woman is Israel. Israel is pregnant for 42 generations from Abraham all the way to Christ. Christ is the baby the woman is giving birth to who is going to save all nations and rule with the rod of his mouth. Now Jesus dies on the cross. When he dies on the cross, history splits in half. And the woman switches from the personage of Israel to become the new Israel, as Paul would say, the spiritual Israel, and the woman becomes the church. And now the church is chosen, as Jesus has said, I have chosen you, you did not choose me. I chose you, I have called you to be kings and priests unto me. As Peter said, you are a royal priesthood. The word of God promises us and tells us that you have been elected for salvation. You have been selected and chosen. And you were chosen before the foundation of the world that the woman is. Israel, pregnant with Christ, gave birth to Christ who gives birth to the church. And the church becomes the second understanding of this woman. This woman is not only Israel, she is also the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the question becomes, how does the church give birth to a baby? The church gives birth to the message and ministry and witness of Jesus. Israel gave birth to Jesus nationally and the church gives birth to Jesus spiritually. His witness in the earth, his message of the cross, our job is to give birth to that message as Israel gave birth to the person. And this birth, this baby, the church is pregnant. And the church is pregnant with the very dream of God. That God has a dream. That whenever Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God had a dream of redemption. A plan is what you call it. A dream is what I'm calling it. He had a plan of redemption to redeem man from his sin. To make it so that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And this dream of God was implanted in Israel. And this dream of God is expressed through the church. And he who has dreams give dreams. And God has given me and you dreams and visions. He's given us ideas and concepts and passions and affections and desires. All that it might promote the glory of Jesus Christ. His dream through the woman. Your vision, your passion, your affection that you are pregnant with is not for your glory. May I share with you, it will never come to pass if you are the one who is getting the glory. You might get the job, you might land the career, you might make the money, you might win all the favor that you could imagine, but if God is not getting the glory, it'll never fulfill your life, it'll never satisfy the requirements of the kingdom, and God will not be in it, and you don't want nothing, I know that's bad English, but it's how I felt like saying it, you don't want nothing that God is not in, he sustains everything we see by the word of his power so Israel has a baby and the baby is the Messiah and the church has a baby and the baby is the message and the glory of God 
And we give birth to that message through our witnessing, through our evangelism, but also through the way we love our family and how we express our lives through the light we shine in a dark world, to how we are salt in the earth, to how we influence change in our culture, to how we influence the growth and the expansion of the kingdom. We give birth to our dream every time you are married and loving it, every time you are living your life in favor of God, every time you're living your life every time you are doing as God has called you to do you are giving birth to that dream you give birth to that dream in every conversation you have you give birth to that dream in every interaction you have you give birth to the dream of the message of Christ that God might be given glory through your life and if he will do anything in your life he will do it as a result of his glory through your life so please hear me now, would you listen? Israel has a baby, pregnant with a baby. That baby is the Messiah for the glory of God. It is in the face of Jesus that we saw the glory of God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Messiah expresses the glory of God. No man has seen the Father, but Jesus exegeted him. He declared him unto us. I know the Father because I saw the Messiah. Philip said, show us the Father, Jesus, and it will suffice us. Jesus says, Philip, have I not been with you so long? And you have not known me. If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. He is the fullest expression of the glory of God's complete attributes. The essence of who God is is demonstrated through the personage of Jesus Christ. He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In him dwells all that is God. He is fully God in every capacity, in every way, in every aspect. The truth of God is in Jesus. The life of God is in Jesus. The goodness of God is in Jesus. The glory of God is in Jesus. The mercy of God is in Jesus. You cannot know the Father if you do not know him. He is the dream of God birthed in the earth. He is the baby that Israel was pregnant with. And just as he is the glory of God, so must you and me express the glory of God. God has invested his glory in rudimentary form in every single person's life. So much so that he took up residence to dwell in our bodies, our bodies, soma, our life, to live in the way we live our lives. He came that he may get glory out of your life. And that's what this year is about, about giving God the glory out of your life. I know we just got finished giving him the glory out of our mouth, but never let your mouth sing about a glory your life is not living. The greatest glory you give to God is out of your life. Can I get a witness here? I don't want to hear just your song or your sermon. I want to hear, does your life reflect the song that you're singing? Does your life reflect the glory of the God you are praising? It is wrong to praise him in this house and live like hell in your house. There has to be a distinct difference. But is anybody hearing what I'm saying to you? You give him the glory. And the reason why he has so touched, bless your Lord, your heart is so that your life might be a glory unto him. Now, what dream do you have? What visions do you have? What, what passions and affections do you have for your life? Here's my question. Do they bring God glory? Is it God's baby or yours? Is it God's child or is it your child? because I've got news for you. Are you hearing me? Are you listening to me? God is under no obligation whatsoever to protect your dream. 
he is under every obligation to protect his own. And everything is his dream. His glory is in everything. Somebody says, somebody says, you know, Pastor, that's, that sounds so, my, that sounds so selfish of him. And he only protects his own dream. I mean, what kind of God is that? That's the kind of God who made and created everything. There's no other agenda but his agenda. If you have an agenda that's not his agenda, then you are saying you have a world you did not create. And you are awesome. You are awesome, but you didn't make nothing. You didn't create nothing. You didn't create something out of nothing. You never spoke ex nihilic. You never called those things that be not as though they were. You never pulled sun out of darkness and light out of obscurity. You never spoke and stars showed up. You never called the earth and grass started growing and trees came into being. You never looked in the sky and said, let there be. And from distant eons past, light started traveling from thousands of light years away to show up on the earth. You never curved any rivers with your fingers or spoken any mountains into place. You never stood over the banister of glory and called man from the dust, formed and shaped him, then breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. You never made a man. You Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? Only one who can do that is God. And if God did it, then God has a right to manage it, oversee it, control it, speak into it, and uphold it with the power of his hands. The arrogance of God. No, the arrogance of man. How shall the clay say to the potter, why have you made me like this? The clay has no power over the potter. The potter has power over the clay. Can I get a witness here? While you're complaining about the power you don't have, I'm thanking God that he gave me the power that I do. I thank God for the grace that he has allowed me to live in, to walk in, to experience. So the baby is in the womb of the woman so that the woman can give birth to the glory of God. And because God is so committed to his glory, come back to the text. Look at what he does. Bible says, and she being with child, verse 2, travailing in birth, pain to be delivered. Because when God has given you a dream for his glory, it takes pain to deliver it. Moms in the room, you know what this verse is saying. Beautiful things come out of broken experiences. Beautiful things are hard to be birthed. If you're going to do something great that gives God the glory, I promise you it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. You're going to be misunderstood. You're going to be maligned. You're going to be laughed at. You're going to be discouraged. You're going to be told it can't happen. You're going to have obstacles in your way. Banks are going to say no. Friends are going to say no. Money is not going to be available. You're going to feel discredited and disqualified. You'll deeply be disappointed. You'll cry in the midnight hours. But oh, if you don't quit, if you don't stop, if you don't give up and lay on the table, foot in the stirrups, and travail to bring out what God has promised you. That's why I pray the way that I pray because I understand what travailing does. When I call on God, if you want something small, you can just whisper out his name. But when you want something big, you got to call his name. There has to be earnest fervency in your prayers. So it says there appeared this woman is pain and to be delivered, about to give birth, and another wonder in heaven appeared. Now look at what the Bible calls him in verse 3. How great red dragon. 
dragon is a Roman metaphor that Gentiles would have clearly understood, Greeks would have clearly understood, as being the thing that opposes that which is good. It is the worst of the serpents. A dragon is the worst of the serpents because it is a deformed and abnormal snake. It's a snake, listen, with legs. Are you hearing me? I don't want to get too deep. Are y'all okay? In the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned at the influence of the snake, what was the curse on the snake? The curse on the snake was to crawl on its belly the rest of its days. It would indicate that the snake was walking before it was crawling. It is a statement of the diminished authority of the snake. He is saying you had a power before you tempted Adam and Eve. I am stripping you of that authority and power demonstrated by your lowly servile position. You've lost your legs and now you are forced to crawl on your belly. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? But here you see a dragon, which is a legged snake, which means that this snake has been in its understanding of apocalyptic literature restored in its power. This is the snake that has been elevated to its power and is walking again. Now, it's a vision. The snake doesn't walk. You get what I'm saying. But it's God's way of trying to communicate. This ain't no ordinary power of the devil. This ain't no ordinary enemy. This is an enemy that has no restraint, who hearkens back to that kind of power he had prior to the curse. It is unrestrained evil. <sighs> is anybody hearing what I'm saying? Now, I got good news and I got bad news. Which one do you want first? So somebody said bad news, okay. The bad news is, the bad news is that the day will come when the snake will have his legs. The day will come when the snake is going to operate in an evil that you ain't never seen before. Was anybody hearing what I'm saying to you? The bad news is that the day will come when the snake will make its last stand against all the powers of God. That's the bad news. How many want the good news? I'm glad you asked for the bad news first. It's homiletically correct to give bad news before you give good news. The good news is that today, right now, snake ain't got no legs. The good news is right now, the snake is cursed. The snake is legless. The snake is powerless. The snake is defeated. The snake has been conquered. The snake has been crushed. He's under the hand, under the feet of Jesus Christ. He's given power to you and I to tread upon snakes and serpents and scorpions. The good news is that when the snake operates with his legs, God's going to rapture the church out of the earth. Man, I feel like preaching. When the snake gets his legs back, God's going to rapture the church out of the earth. Is there anybody in the building that can't wait? Until that day when the clouds shall open and the Son of Man shall appear faster than a horse ever ran down a track, faster than a wheel ever turned on his axis, faster than lightning that flashes from the sky in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. We shall be caught up. That's the good news. 
the dragon the dragon has seven heads ten horns seven crowns of authority on his heads seven means full and complete horns represent power and authority and strength the horns of the altar <sighs> can't do that <laughs> The altar has four horns on every corner. And when David was at his wit's end, he went into the temple, the tabernacle. And David fell down at the Holy of Holies. And they said, David, don't you go in there. David said, that's where the altar is. And David went in and held on to the horns of the altar. Is there anybody in the building? Have you ever prayed like that? Where you're holding on to the power of the throne. You're holding on to the horns of the altar. The power of the altar. The authority of the altar. The strength of the throne. This is why Paul said, or why the writer of Hebrews said, let us come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Can I get a witness here? It's why when Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom that God tore it from heaven so that every man, woman, boy, and girl would have access to the horns of the altar. When you see me praying at midnight, I'm holding on to the horns. When you see me crying my tears, I'm holding on to the horns. When you see me fasting and praying, I'm holding on to the horns. When you see me walking in the house and humming my song, I'm holding on to the horns. Is there anybody here that has horn holding power? This dragon, sorry for that. <laughs> Let me return to the text. He has 10 horns, whole. His authority over the earth is whole, 10, complete, seven. Uncontested, it says in, his tail drew a third part of the stars, cast them to the earth. I ain't gonna talk about that. <laughs> and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to give birth to her child. Now listen, to devour the baby as soon as it was born. Oh man, I'm gonna have to stop. You've got you've got the dragon satan outside the delivery room walking back and forth peeping in the window waiting to see when that baby gonna be born because as soon as the baby is born i gotta catch that baby and devour that baby because that baby is the very glory of God. And if I let this baby be born, oh, he'll draw all men under him. I'll lose my authority. I'll lose my power. I'll lose my position. The kings of this earth, the kingdoms of this earth will become the kingdoms of his God and of his Christ. I can't let that baby be born. He walks waiting to devour. Can I get a witness here? Did not the Bible tell us that there is an enemy who walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may, be de whom he may devour? Can I get a witness here? Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Now notice who he's after. Catch who he's after. He's not after the woman. He's disinterested in the woman. 
He could care less about the woman. He is after the baby that's in the woman's womb. The reason why we never birth anything is because you think Satan is after you. He ain't thinking about you. He could care less about you. He's after that baby that God deposited in you. He's after that dream, that vision, that home, that marriage, those kids, that future, your potential. He's trying to destroy the seed God put in you, but don't let him have it. There is a God that says if you can birth it, I can protect it. If you can bring it to pass, I can catch it. If you can birth it, he can protect it. If you can birth it, he can take care of it. If you can birth it, he can keep it. He will keep that which is committed unto us against that day. Can I get a witness here? He that begun a good thing, a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Don't stop praying. Don't stop pushing. Don't stop travailing. Don't stop painting. Keep on believing. It's going to come to pass. Keep on praying. God's going to do it. Keep on trusting. God's going to do it. Somebody say yes. Yes. Won't he do it? If you trust him, won't he do it? If you believe in him, won't he do it? It says, verse 5, and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. <laughs> She brought the child. Satan's outside waiting. God said, if this baby gives me glory, I will catch him up and remove him from the powers of the dragon. Is anybody hearing this? If the baby gives me glory, if the baby is my dream, I'll catch him and remove him from the danger. Y'all know we got a dream. You know it's in the back of my mind, but I ain't gonna worry you with it this morning. But don't you have one? Don't you have a dream? Huh? Do you have something in your belly? Do you have something that you're pregnant with? Do you have something you believe in God for? Do you have something you're trusting God for? Now don't look at me like you ain't got nothing. People, I can tell who has a dream. The folks who ain't got no dream, they're nodding right now. They're sleeping right now. But oh, if God done showed you something, if God done told you something, if God gave you an idea, it takes one idea that can change the whole world. Can I get a witness here? He caught the dream, catches up the dream. God protects that which is committed to him. That thing that gives him glory, he protects and cover it. He does not, he does not protect it because it's what you want. He protects it because it's what he wants. There is a natural frustration that we have with the sovereignty of God. We have a natural resistance to the sovereignty of God because we want to be sovereign in some capacity. 
ourselves. I mean, we quote the poem, I am the master of my own fate. And I understand the poem, and it has great value, of course. It's not theologically correct. You are not the master of your own fate. You are the recipient of his divine destiny. You see, your life was planned before you got here. Don't talk about being unfair. I already argued that point. You didn't make you. Since you didn't make you, you can't plan you. God has planned you. And he spends all of our days trying to convince us to accept his plan. He's given you free will. He's given you free moral agency. You have the authority and you have the ability to resist his plan. You can resist, but you can't produce success. You can resist, but you can't bring blessing. You can resist, but you can't bring favor. Is anybody hearing what, you're saying, what I'm saying to you? The more you resist, the less you are blessed. Ah, oh, man. You guys don't hear what I'm trying to communicate. When you submit to the sovereignty of God, when you bow beneath his feet and recognize his absolute control over the affairs of your life, a shift happens in your spirit. Now what was difficult becomes easy. He supplies what's called an anointing. Has anybody ever been anointed? Child, if you ain't been anointed, you don't know what you're missing. The anointing comes alongside and it picks you up when you can't pick yourself up. The anointing comes alongside and it helps you out when you can't help yourself out. The anointing comes alongside and it strengthens you where you're weak. It holds you up where you're leaning. It props you up where you're falling down. Is there anybody here that's ever had the oil of the Holy Ghost to smear over your job, to smear over your business, to smear over your family? He'll do what you can't He'll give you power to do what you never imagined. So he catches up this baby. So now that the baby is caught up, the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they, it doesn't even say who they is. Wilderness is a desert. Ain't nobody there. Nobody is in the desert but scorpions, jackals, and creepy crawly things that sting when they bite <laughs> and kill you <laughs> if you stay too long. That's all that's in the wilderness. Ain't nothing else in the wilderness. And he says that this woman <laughs> fled to a prepared place that God knew <laughs> he, she was going to need some protection. So he prepared a place for her to find refuge. Now, I was a little bothered that it was a wilderness. I would have thought that God would have prepared a little sweet, a little small sweet at the Ritz Carlton. I would have thought that he would have made it so that she had a little room service. You know, he's God, first class all the way. And when I read this, I said, Lord, did you mean wilderness? He said, yeah, I had to put her in the wilderness. I said, why, they was booked up at the town place? Sweets? He said, no, 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 no. They had plenty of room over there. But if I put her there, she would forget to give me the glory. If I make it too comfortable for her, she will neglect to give me the praise she'll start smelling herself and thinking she grown and feel like she did it by herself. So what I did was I made a place for her in an uncomfortable area 
in a bad spot. I prepared a table for her in the presence of her enemies. Can I get a witness here? I made it so she has need to pray every now and then. I made it so that when things go right, she knows she didn't do it. She's got to give me the glory because can't nobody bring something good out of something bad like I can. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Can Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean thing? Only God can. So I said, okay, you got her in the wilderness. Why did you put her in the wilderness? Why did you, why, why just take her up to heaven? And let her go be with you. Why leave her on the earth? He said, Marlon, because you understand something. I got more babies. I need her to birth. Her work ain't finished yet. There's more that she's called to do. I'm done preaching, but is there anybody in the building that can testify? I got more babies that God's called me to birth. Is there anybody here that can help me testify? I ain't done yet. God ain't through with me yet. Be patient with me. God ain't through with me yet. Is there anybody in the building that can help me testify? God has got more work for me. God has got more business. God has got more blessings. God has got more power. God say yes. He ain't done yet. What I want to tell you this morning is God ain't done yet. I know you're tired, but pray, baby. He ain't done yet. God's still working on you. God's still producing out of you. God's still developing you. God's still forming you and molding you and shaping you. Is there anybody here that's glad about it? There's more in me. Every head bowed. Every eye closed. Bible says that this lady was protected and fed by the scorpions and the serpents and the dragons. Ain't it strange how God will use your enemy to be your footstool? And that's what I want to say to you today. There is a place of refuge, of hope, of possibilities. A place where you can give birth to your dreams and be confident that God's going to catch them. Why did you stop dreaming? Who hath bewitched you? That you should stop dreaming. What failure is final? What disappointments have the power to derail you? If God gives you a dream, birth it. Step out on nothing and believe that something is there. If you fail, fail giving it all you got. Fail doing everything you can. If you fall, don't land soft, fall hard. 
all hard. Because if you're going to have this, you got to go all in. I don't have a sports analogy. I wish I had a sports analogy. I don't really have one. But I'm reminded a picture of an image that I saw. It was a young lady, young girl, young man, I'm not sure which one, but it's a young man it was. He was holding the back of his calf. Obviously he had torn something. His daddy came out of the stands. His father came on that track field. And he was trying to run that race. And he fell. And he fell hard. And his daddy came and picked him up. His daddy put his arms around him. His daddy carried his son over the finish line. Don't you know who your daddy is? Don't you know who your daddy is? He ain't gonna leave you there. He ain't gonna leave you there. Give it all you got. And if you fail, get back up and do it again. And if you fail again, get back up and do it again as long as there's breath in your body you keep doing it you keep doing it you keep doing it you keep doing it it's an old testament story about a prophet elisha and young prophets they were cutting down trees trying to build a convent school of prophecy and while they were cutting this tree down, the axe handle fell off of the, the axe fell off the axe handle and the iron fell into the water, to the river. And the young prophet said, oh, master, what shall we do? It was borrowed. It wasn't mine. The beauty, the beautiful thing about the grace of God is it ain't yours. The beautiful thing about God's anointing is that it's not yours. It's His. And the prophet knew that I can't cut this tree down without it. If I knock this tree with a wooden axe, it'll never fall. I need the iron of the axe head to chop this tree down. And that iron wasn't mine. I borrowed it from somebody else. And now it has fallen in the river. Do you know what the prophet did? The prophet went to that river. He broke off a branch of that tree. And he stood over that river. And he took that branch and threw it in the water. And when he threw that branch in the water, the iron that had sunk to the bottom of the river started floating. And the iron floated to the top and the iron started swimming over to the banks where the prophet was. Now I ain't trying to preach sermon number two. But all I'm trying to tell you that if you possess something that belongs to God and if by any means you might lose it or lose contact with it if you come to him and say alas master what shall we do God has a branch that he can break off a tree and throw it in the water of your circumstances and the anointing will begin to swim he'll bring back that thing you thought you lost As long as you let it bring him glory. Every head bowed, every eye closed, every hand lifted. God, use our life to bring you glory. Use our life to honor you. 
use our life to glorify you with everything we have be glorified catch our vision catch our dream the one you placed in our womb may we bring it to pass may we birth it in our circumstances may it bring you glory in the beautiful name of the Lord Jesus all right, we're going home. Heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed. If you're in this room and you've never given Jesus your life, you've never asked him in your heart as your savior, you are not born again and you know you need to be, start the year right. Start the year right. Get out of your seat. Find the aisle that you are standing close by and make your way down front and make it clear that you want Jesus in your life that you want Jesus to lead your life get out of your seat find an aisle and come down to this altar and if you're here and God told you that this church is where he's calling you to and you know this is home you're fully aware of it then get out of your seat tell the person you're standing beside excuse me I got to get my life right with God we're gonna sing this song of worship and I want you to come hands raised. I want you to come with hearts, with hearts lifted. I want you to come to him. Get out of your seats and make your way to Jesus. Come on, saints of God. Let's give God the glory. Let's give God the praise. Get out of your seat and make your way. I will do. I will do anything. Just to see. Bless you. Somebody give God glory, would you? Come on and give the Lord glory. I need you to praise him as if it were your son, your daughter, your mom, your sister. Bless you, darling. Bless you, young lady. Come on and bless the Lord in this house. Bless you, young lady. Come on. Thank you for bringing her down. Come on, take her on over. Somebody give the Lord the glory, would you? Lift your hands up in the presence of the Lord. watching us by stream if you've never given your life to Jesus you've never asked him in your heart as your Savior you don't know the Lord Jesus today you're still watching because God is speaking to you you don't have to turn this stream off and stay the way you are you are here for a reason I want you to look in the chat space and if you're watching this on a TV screen grab your tablet or your smartphone Go to our website or go to our YouTube page and find the chat space. Copy and paste a link there. Put it in your browser. That link takes you to a Zoom room. I know it's Zoom. Just turn your camera off and leave your heart open. There's leaders and ministers waiting right now live to minister to you, to talk to you, to guide you in a relationship with Jesus Christ. I pray that you'll do that today. Would you give God praise for those online who are responding right now? All right, we're getting ready to go home. But I know that you're in this room and you know that God's called you to get out of your seat and make your way down here. And you think you excused yourself from it, but I want to tell you, no, you didn't. You don't need us to plead and beg with you. You know what God's called you to do. We're gonna sing this one more time and worship God. If you're here and you're supposed to be at this altar, get out of your seat, make that big step. It's big and you're able to do it. We're gonna sing, you make up your mind and make a decision for the Lord Jesus. Everything you have, let's sing to the Lord now.
day, man, again. All right. We're getting ready to go home. I love you guys so much. I love you so much. Next Sunday, we're going to talk our last message on refuge. We're going to look at a powerful psalm that promises that God will protect us and God will keep us. I pray that you are in this fast and that you are honoring God with this fast. If you're not fasting, may I strongly encourage you, fast. You can start today. You can start this evening. There's so many different ways to fast. You can fast a meal. You can fast in the daylight hours. You can fast a day. You can fast a few days. You can fast intermittently. You can fast by giving up certain foods. Or you can fast a non-food fast. But don't let this time pass. This is a season for you and God to be connected to each other. Amen. All right, I love you so, 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 so very much. Meet us in the morning at 7 a.m. for morning prayer. Don't miss it. It's going to be a blessing. If you didn't read the devotionals Saturday and Sunday because we weren't meeting together, go back tonight, read that devotional, spend some time with God before you close your eyes and sleep. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you. The Lord grant you his peace. And you're rising and you're setting, you're coming and you're going today and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. In the lobby, there's Michael and others are waiting to talk about the warming station. You can learn service today. We're so excited, we're so happy that you were able to join us here and really hear what Pastor was saying about the Lord being our refuge and our strength and everything across the board. So again. Join us in the Zoom Loom Rink if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ or to join our church ministry. And, uh, and if you want to make a decision today, please, please join us in that particular Zoom room. God bless you. We thank you for joining us. And we'll see you all on tomorrow with Pastor Harris at 7 a.m. For, for morning prayer and for Bible study and for worship service throughout the week. God bless you.